factors which crowd the Earth's crust in a world no longer dominated by value proves to be a much more radical question, I think, and a much more determinate negation, um, rather than the one of how to render the metropolis and thus, in the end, ourselves useless. Thank you. Being an anarchist conference, I changed it at the last minute. Um, but it's called the Anarchist Geography of Notebooks. Um, give me a second. I have to plug this into the run a program that we show for the Freely letting anyone in for their reasonable private property. 
Nowhere is this concern for the veracity of geography more evident than one of the letters that accompanied the first four printings of Utopia. It's a letter from Moore to his friend and character in the book, Peter Giles, who's a Flemish um, intellectual at the time. In this letter, this public letter, Moore tells Giles very worried that he may have gotten a fact wrong about the geography of Utopia. Moore remembers hearing from Raphael Pippa that a certain bridge is 500 paces long, but his servant, who's there attending the conversation, remembers hearing that the river was only 300 paces wide. This creates a problem. How can you have a 500 pace long bridge over a 300 pace long river, right? To resolve this question, Moore asked Giles to ask if the day himself, either by letter or in person when he sees him next, for the true measurement. Now, through this and many other instances, Moore convinces us that there is a geography of utopia, albeit perhaps inaccurately recorded, but it does exist. It exists in space and place, though, we're told in another letter, through an unfortunately timed cough. More is kept from hearing where it actually is located on the map of the world. Um, if Lede is describing some sort of cough and, and it's lost forever to the world. But things are not so straightforward. More's Utopia is a curious book with contradictions and riddles. The grandest and best known, of course, is the title itself. Utopia is a made up word composed by more of the Greek of Bu and Topus. And it's a place which is literally no place. In addition, the storyteller, the narrator of this magical land is called Raphael Hithlide, or in Hithlide is the original Latin, which stems from the Greek of Uthlos, which means nonsense. So here we are, being told a story of a place which is named out of existence by a narrator whose name is unreliable. Read through this lens, Moore's concern with geographic detail is not quite a different meaning. Think back to that conversation with Peter Giles with a specific measurement of a bridge. Okay? Go ask Raphael when you see him next. Well, the joke is, there is no Raphael, and no one's ever going to see him. No facts will be checked because there is no fact checker. In a letter attached to the 1517 edition, Moore defends the facticity of his account openly, arguing that if it was merely fiction, he would have had the sense and wit to offer clues to tip off his learned audience. He says, if I had merely such given names to the governor, the river, the city, and the island, as would indicate to the knowing reader that the island was nowhere, the city a phantom, and river waterless, and the governor without a people, I wouldn't have been hard to do. It would have been much more clever than what I actually did. Now, the joke here, which any erudite reader would know, which is, of course, the only people reading in the 16th century, is that this is exactly what Moore has done. Utopia, the name of the island, means nowhere. Almorat, the utopian city, described means phantom, and so on. And so begins the 500 year long scholarly debate. You think it's been, you know, debates about what the COVID meant and going on. No, 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 no. <laughs> this goes on much longer than this, okay? <laughs> Is the entirety of Moore's utopia an earnest effort to map out an imaginary utopian, utopian geography? Or is it meant merely as satire, an exercise in demonstrating the impossibility of such a space and place? Now, I actually think that this debate misses the point entirely. <coughs> it obfuscates rather than clarifies, and it doesn't get at the genius of utopia. Because the genius of utopia is that it's both sincere and absurd simultaneously. Written in the tradition of serial literary, or serious play, that Moore admired so much in the classic authors, the story presents itself as both fact and fiction, sincere and satirical, earnest and absurd. Utopia is some place and no place. Moore takes great pains to convince the reader that Utopia is a real place. And it is through the veracity of this description that we can start to imagine this some place that's radically different than the world we presently inhabit. Reading Utopia, we experience a sense of radical alterity. What is foreign becomes familiar, and what is unnatural is naturalized. In other words, we're brought to a different place, which allows us to denaturalize ourselves from our present space and place. An alternative vision is provided by Moore, and then it's destabilized. And this destabilization is the key, for it is the presentation of utopia as no place, and its narrator as nonsense, which opens up a space 
for our imagination, to wonder what our vision of an alternative someplace might be like. That is, Moore imagines an alternative to the 16th century Europe that he then reveals to be work of imagination. It is, after all, no place. But the reader has been infected. Another option has been shown. They can't safely return to assurances of their own present as the naturalness of their own world has been disrupted. Whereas the old World War I song went, how are you going to keep them back on the farm after they've seen Paris? The open path that. <laughs> the opening lines of a brief poem attached to the first printings of Utopia read this. Will thou know what wonders strange be in the land that late was found? Will thou learn in thy life to lead by diverse ways that God would be? Once an alternative, diverse ways that God would be, has been imagined, to stay where one is or to try something else becomes a question that demands attention and choice. Yet the choice that Moore offers us is not an easy one. By destabilizing his own design of an ideal society, he keeps us from short-circuiting this imaginative moment into a fixed imaginary, a realizable future. We have to generate our own plans because the plan he offers up is untenable, unrealizable. The problem with many social imaginaries is that they posit themselves as a realizable possibility. Their designers imagine a future or an alternative and present it as the future or the alternative. Actually, it's a socialist instance. But what if impossibility is incorporated into the design in the first place? This is exactly what Moore does. By positioning his imaginary someplace at no place, he escapes the problems that typically haunt imaginaries. Yes, the alternatives he describes are sometimes absurd, a place called no place. But that conscious absurdity is also what keeps utopia from being a singular and authoritative narrative that is a closed act of imagination <coughs> to be either accepted or rejected. The book, moving metaphors from one meaning to another, functions as a sort of source code providing the core of what can and must be modified by us in order to create a functionally potent program. <coughs> or as a program itself, it repeatedly crashes. Utopia is not a serious plan, nor, however, is it a prank. It's actually a prompt, a prompt for future imagination on the part of the reader spectator. It's a design for what Hakeem Bey has identified, and my friend and colleague Stephen Shikadis has been utilizing quite effectively, an imaginal machine. Now, I want to provide you an example of this machinery in action, okay? Which is New Babylon, as, as it's currently being constructed in New York City. Um, some of you may know what New Babylon is, but the original New Babylon was created by Constant Neuenhaus, who was a Dutch artist and one of the founders of the Situation of International, who was later purged as it seems most people were from the Situation of International. Um, Constant spent a good chunk of his life from 1956 to 1974 creating a model for what can best be described as an anarchist geography. And here's a particularly good description. A vast network of enormous, multi-level interior spaces propagates to eventually cover the planet. These interconnected sectors float above the ground on tall columns. While vehicular traffic rushes underneath and air traffic lands on the roof, the inhabitants drift by foot through the huge laboratory interiors, endlessly reconstructing the atmosphere of the spaces. Every aspect of the environment can be controlled and reconfigured spontaneously. Social life becomes architectural play. Architecture becomes a flickering display of interacting desires. That's from Mark Wigley, who's the Dean of the Architecture School of Columbia, who uh, relatively recently wrote, wrote a book on Constance New Babylon. New Babylon is an anarchist geography of free association. Homo ludens, that is, humans at play, wander nomadically through its structure freely and continuously transforming the relationships to one another and in, their, in their space, in turn transforming the physical and social geography. Now, Constance Utopia was sequestered to his paintings and drawings and a massive model on display at the museum in The Hague. 